So we'll do each of the three lectures that we've done. Back to body organization. So what we'll do is just go through these, and if we have more questions, we can dive down into the actual pictures from there. But how living things are organized from the smallest, sort of like you go the atoms, and then you become organelles, and the cells, and the tissues, and then the organs, and the organs. So it's sort of that sequence. So you just have overall, <clears throat> that overall in perspective. Homeostasis, that one's a little more important component from this chapter. So the homeostasis is really knowing the difference between the positive and the negative feedback loops. So you've got the majority of the feedback loops we're going to deal with are the negative feedback. That's how our body really works is with the negative feedback loops. So when we do, um, for instance, blood sugar, if we eat a lot of jelly beans, our blood glucose levels go up. And so in order to um, get back to normal, we use a negative feedback loop. So they start when our body deviates from normal. So deviating from normal would be going high blood glucose. So now we'll go through a negative feedback loop scenario. That would be kick in insulin, insulin gets released, blood glucose gets put into the cells. So the levels in the blood drop down and because they drop back down to normal, it feeds back into the pancreas and turns off the release of insulin. So in that scenario, you have, you've deviated from a normal level, your body did something to fix it, went back to a normal level, and then it turned it back off. So it's like a thermostat, you know, the house gets too hot, kicks on the AC for a while, cools down, the AC kicks off, and waits for it to deviate again. So that's just a negative feedback loop. Um, and a positive feedback, there's really only two scenarios that we would really consider. There's a few more in the body, but the two biggies are um, blood clotting. Literally, if you have a cut in a vessel, from the view inside the vessel, you're just going to see collagen in the walls, which is not something that's normally seen. So a platelet would stick there. And then if the platelet sticks there, it makes that platelet becomes stickier and more platelets stick and more platelets stick. So that's positive feedback. When you have one event, but it amplifies and it makes it happen more and more until an end point, which at which point that's just when the hole is sealed up and then there's no more exposed collagen. The other example being labor, you have some oxytocin being released that's going to cause a uterine contraction. That feeds back into the brain to send even more oxytocin and the next uterine contraction becomes stronger. They become greater in, in intensity and greater um, in, in frequency. So that's an example of a positive feedback. The end point in that scenario is finally the baby is kicked out of the body. So, and then it ends. So that's what, so those are unusual because our body deals with mostly negative feedback. Um, we're gonna deal with terminology. So that's where if you have a body map of a person where you have say, you know, brachial, lumbar. So you're gonna get a generic name. It might be like neck. What's the anatomical name for neck? And then you'll write cervical or, you know, what's the anatomical name for, you know, forehead or some frontal. Got it. You've been studying. And so, you know, ear, ezotic. So just know that body map of what the anatomical terms for a normal term of something. Then we have um, terminally referring to body position. So of course we have anatomical position palms up, thumbs outward, so that our bones and our forearms are parallel to each other. We also want to do um, sentences. You want to be able to, if you're using distal, superior, inferior, you don't want to say the toes are inferior. You would want to say something like, you know, your belly button is inferior to your chin. Like it's always something in relation to something else. So just know how to write the sentences properly using those type of terms. Proximal distal refers to the limbs, where superior and inferior is more of a torso issue. Um, you have superficial and deep that goes into the body. So you could say, you know, the bones are deep to the muscle or, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Your intestine is deep to the belly button or something like that. It's always something in relation to something else. Um, quadrants and regions. I'm really gonna, your test is gonna have the regions and not the quadrants. So that way we'll just not have any confusion. So that's the one that's the tic-tac-toe board. So you should know the nine um, regions that there are. 
left. And so you'll be asked the handout that I just gave you is a good practice for that. It's probably the best practice you have for that. Um, you should also know the divisional planes. The divisional planes are how we slice if we had to guillotine our body. So there's three planes that we can slice our body along. The, if the body is, um, guillotine were to come straight down, it would be a frontal or coronal slice. Either term works fine. Um, and that would be like if I split the body into anterior and posterior halves. Or you can move that guillotine and slice it straight down the middle, being a sagittal slice, and you split the body into right and left sides. Or you have transverse slice, which divides the body into a superior inferior portion. So those are the three dimensions that you can do that. Um, and then the body cavities. So inside we have a dorsal cavity and a ventral cavity. So one in the back, one in the front. Then there's the subcavities. In the dorsal cavity portion, you would have the cranial and vertebral. So those are two that makes up the dorsal cavity. Of the ventral cavity, you would have thoracic and abdominal pelvic. Those are the two biggies that make up the ventral cavity. But then you can kind of go in, in the abdominal pelvic, it's abdominal and pelvic. You know, like then those are the sub sub cavities. In the thoracic area, you have the thoracic cavity above the diaphragm, and it contains the pleural cavity, pleural is going to refer to lungs, and the pericardial cavity, where the heart's going to be, and then the space in between is just mediastinum. So those would be sort of subsections of that. So you should be familiar with that. And then the serous membranes, who can tell me the two membranes of a serous membrane? Parietal and visceral, exactly. So which one is going to be touching on the surface of the tissue itself? Visceral. So give me an example of the membrane that's touching the surface of the lungs. Visceral pleura. Yeah, so you'll say the position of the membrane first and then the, the location. So what about around the heart, there would be that the heart's within a sac that you'd have to cut open to see the surface. So this is not the one adhered to the surface, it's just that it would be around that. What would that be called? Parietal pericardium. Parietal pericardium. Excellent. Okay, you got it. So any more questions on this part? I think that's it for regions and cavities. And we'll go on to tissues. For our tissue section, we're going to have the, first of all, what are the four main tissue types? Epithelial, Epithelial muscular, connective, muscular, and nervous. Excellent. So you have to know the big picture of the four main tissue types, and then now we'll go into epithelial tissue. What are the functions of epithelial tissue? Or some just protection, pumping, um, transport. What diffusion, excellent. So you've got a lot of things. And so what are some characteristics of it, of epithelial tissue? One layer. It's gonna not always one layer. Because it could be stratified. The what? The cells. Yeah, so the cells are gonna be jammed up next to each other. We're gonna always be on a basement membrane, which means the other side's gonna be free to a space. The space could be the universe, because it's on the surface of your skin, or if it's lining your stomach, the space is the stomach. You know, so it's going to have one side facing out into a space, one side anchored onto your body. So it's going to cover or line something. That's going to be the quality. And it's also avascular. What does that mean? No blood vessels. So how does it live? It gets in the basement membrane. Mm -hmm. So in the example of the epidermis, yes, the bottom layer has vessels from the dermis that it would get nutrients from. Stratified, and there's several layers thick, the ones further away begin to die. And that sometimes is a good thing. So dying of cells doesn't always have to be a bad thing. In the case of your epidermis, it's good because it's part of our protection that we have actually dead surface. So we're less likely to get invaded by viruses and things like that because it can't do damage to a dead cell. And then dead cells and if bacteria is laying on us and it floats away in our dry flaky skin, you know, so it's part of our protection. What's an endocrine versus an exocrine gland? Endocrines goes in the blood. 
Out a duct, yep, so it gets excreted and it's going out a duct into a space. So the space could be the universe onto the skin, the space could be into the stomach, like through the, um, the, gla or the acid glands in your stomach. We'll talk more about those when we get to 202. So it's just sending, going out a duct, going out somewhere. But endocrine means it's just gonna be, the product is now going into the blood and now it's gonna circulate within the body. There are three types of glands and three modes of secretion. What are the three glands I'm talking about? Merocrine. So what does that secrete and how does it do it? Regular watery sweat. And um, how, what's going on in the cell with that? How does it secrete it? So the merocrine or ecrine, they're the same. Sudoriferous, mero, sudoriferous ecrine does it by the merocrine method, if you will. Um, and that method is the cell makes the product and it just lets the product out, but the cell stays there as a little sweat factory. It's just making more, making more, and whatever's coming out in the sweat, it packages it up and sends it out. And, and the cell remains intact. What about the next kind of sweat glands? Well, the next kind of sweat glands, so we'll do this in contrast. Apocrine, so the sudoriferous apocrine glands do it by the apocrine method. How is that a different than the merocrine method? Yes, so there's parts of the cell, the cytoplasm that actually gets pinched off and that goes out with the product. So not only would you get sweat, but you get cell chunks with it. But the cell itself doesn't become destroyed, it's just piecing it off and it's growing back, but the cell still remains intact and a lot, well not all the way intact, but parts that it lets go, goes out. So that's the apocrine. So those um, type of glands are located where? Armpits, genitals, and because they're always gonna be associated with a hair follicle. Um, it doesn't always have to, it won't be like not all your hair follicles, not gonna be like your eyebrow, but in those regions in particular, so they come out with the hair follicles. And so they have to do more with pheromones, things like that. So the last one is the sebaceous gland. And what type of method is it and what does it release? Yes. Yeah. So the whole cell just blows itself up. The whole cell becomes destroyed. So a whole brand new cell has to grow up in its place and then that gets released. So those get secreted out. Um, what, what kind of ducts do they go out? Not really a duct. It's a whale. It's always going to be associated with what? Hair. So it's going to go out. This duct is really the hair follicle. So it's just kind of going out that way. Good job on the epithelial tissue. The connective tissues, what are the main three main components of connective tissue? So fibers is one component. Collagen is just one type. So we'll just, before we dive in, so of the three com components in all of connective tissue, fibers is one part. What's another part? Ground substance, that's another part. And cells, perfect. So you need cells, you need the ground substance, which is like the jelly or the, ge you know, the gelatinous type mixture. And it doesn't have to be really gelatinous. It could get more stiff, like you would see in, say, cartilage. Or it could get real watery, like you see in blood. So you're going to have this ground substance, sort of like the medium that the cells and the fibers exist within. So of the cells, um, or of the, we'll do the fibers. Of the fibers, we learned about three specific fiber types. And you mentioned collagen. What's another one? Reticular is another fiber type. And what, el elastin, perfect. So those are the three fiber types that we're going to deal with. Then um, we learned a couple of cells. We didn't learn all of the cells. So we learned the prefix for bone cells and the prefix for cartilage cells. What's the bone prefix? Osteo, osteo and cell would be osteocyte. But what about if we're going to build bone? What are they called? Osteoblast. Osteoblast. And if we're going to tear down bone? Osteoclast. Perfect. So what is a cartilage cell? Chondrocyte. 
Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just send the cells we learned. Backtrack quickly onto the epithelial tissue. We should also know for the epithelial tissue whether they were simple, the shapes, simple, um, or sorry, whether they're stratified, one layer or two, simple or stratified, and then we need to know the three shapes, the squamous, the cuboidal, and the columnar, and how to write the name out and identify them. Okay. So now in the connective tissue, we have the three categories. We have the loose, the dense, and the cartilage, and then we have sort of the extra two that fit into the connective tissue category but aren't in either of the categories, and that would be blood and bone. So we'll sort of put blood and bone off to the side, because we'll talk about bone separately, and we'll talk about blood next semester but they're still in the connective tissue family, so we just mention them anyways. So the main um, three main connective tissue proper would be the loose category, the dense category, and the cartilage. So who can name the three loose connective tissues? Areolar, reticular, and adipose. Okay, and so you should know, be able to see them, spot them, know where they are in the body and their function. What about the dense? Dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue, and elastic dense. Excellent. And then we have the three types of cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. Excellent. Which is the most common type of cartilage? Hyaline cartilage. And where would we find hyaline cartilage? And it'd be the middle part of the nose, because the top part of the nose is bone. The middle part is hyaline cartilage, and the end part, if you're, watch, if you're old school like me and watch Bewitched, then that part's your elastic cartilage. That's going to be the fibrocartilage. So the others is important, and I'm only asking this because it's going to be relevant when we do the bone physiology component. It's hyaline cartilage is also the cartilage used for articular cartilage. What does that mean? And where's that? It's at the end of bones. Uh, yeah, so it's the end of bones and it also forms the epiphysis. So hyaline cartilage is going to be capping the ends of bones. It's what's inside a joint. So it keeps the joint smooth. So somebody has arthritis, it's actually their hyaline cartilage that's getting eroded away within a joint, and that's what's the painful component that forms epiphyseal plates for bone growth in kids, but then when that goes away, the articular cartilage on the outside remains. So you guys should be able to spot them on, I'll have, uh, I think I have four or five histology images. So the picture, first thing when you see a picture, name it. Where is that, name that what type of tissue is it? What does it do? Where is it at in the body? And then, and then you should know their characteristics. So on the multiple choice portion of the exam, you know, it might say like, what's the strongest connective tissue type? That would be dense regular, because they're all lined up in the same line, so it's going to maximize its strength from point A to point B. It's only two-dimensional strength, but it is the strongest, because um, you get more collagen packed in there. Um, and then you might say, like, what other, what type of connective tissue would be found in the spleen for filtering? And so it's sort of naming stuff that it's doing, and then you should be able to come up with a tissue type that's responsible for that. The same as epithelial tissue, too. Like, what's going to make up um, glands? And then in your mind, you're like, oh, that's pumping. That's going to be a cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelial tissue or things like that. So you should know where the tissues are located. There are three types of muscle. Who can tell me those muscle types? Skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Which ones, one or ones, has many nuclei per cell? Only skeletal. Which one or ones is involuntary, meaning you, your brain can't control what it's doing? Cardiac and smooth, excellent. What, um, where would we find cardiac muscle? Only in the heart. Where would we find smooth muscle? Intestines, it's moving food along, it's around blood vessels, the stomach, any of our organs that require any kind of movement like that. So for stomach growling, that's our smooth muscle around our stomach, kind of making noises, moves food along, uterus, um, things like that. Okay. And think what else about uh, skeletal muscles, uh, cardiac. Which one conducts electricity? Uh, 
The cardiac muscle. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then we've got nervous tissue. So we're really not going to go into nervous tissues. You need to know about it. There's neuroglia and there are neurons, but we're going to go into more detail in unit two in neurophysiology. So we just, all we need to know is if you see a little picture of a neuron, just like there's nervous tissue and it's one of the four main tissue types. And then that's pretty much the limit of your need to know at this point. And then we'll dive into it a lot more detail. Okay. Any questions on tissues? So on to the integumentary system. So of the integumentary system, the four parts are we're going to do just overall what's its job. Second of all, just the epidermis on top, the dermis underneath, which is actually the easiest part of this whole thing. And that's really what skin is. I always think that's really ironic. What true skin is, is the dermis. And then that's the shortest and easy part on this chapter. Then we'll talk about some of the accessory structures. Most of them are epithelial tissue, but they're anchored down in the dermis. And then we'll do skin repairs and, sort of, and the burns, the depth as well as the extent. What we have as far as functions in epidermis is know what the cutaneous membrane is. What are the components of the cutaneous membrane? Um, so everything really is based on the dermis. That's the true skin. That's where a dense irregular connective tissue is housed. So on top of the dermis, we have the epithelial tissue that that is epidermis. And then below the dermis, we have that loose, area, um, loose adipose connective tissue and that's hypodermis. So everything, the dermis is a better term to use than the cutaneous membrane. I just include that here because some textbooks refer to the cutaneous membrane as your skin. And then we should know the functions of skin. Some of the functions of the skin would be this, where you're dealing with abrasion, just some many forms of protection, as well as immune system. So if someone sneezes on us, we have dead skin. That's a part of our immune system protection. And our body faced with the lack of immune system protection for burn victims. UV blocking, what part of the skin handles UV blocking? That would be the epidermis. Now what part of the epidermis, what cells specifically? Melanocytes, and they make melanin, which is the pigment. The more you're out in the sun, the more melanin gets produced. Some people are just already genetically predisposed to just make more melanin, melanin from the get-go. Temperature regulation, secretion, um, those are things like glands, sweating, sensation. We have nerve endings up on our skin, obviously, and vitamin D. So we're going to create, um, activate vitamin D with our UV. So our melanin, we want to keep UV light away to protect ourselves. But at the same time, we want a little bit of UV light in because that's also used to convert vitamin D. So it's a love-hate relationship. Our body kind of has to have a right balance for vitamin D. You should know the layers. And when I do ask you with the layers, which you will be seeing a histology slide on your practical, you will have to name the layers. You have to always include the stratum with it. Strat if we're gonna go from outermost to innermost, it'll be stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basal, or stratum germinativum. However you want it, the bottom layer has two names. You can choose either one. Stratum is part of it. You need to include that. You should know them by their features. Um, the basal is the fresh brand new cells. It's the closest to the blood supply down in the dermis. And so they're going to be a little more perky and bigger cells. And as you go further away, they, get, they die and they get a little bit more pancake shaped and smashed. So you've got the brand new keratinocytes in the stratum basal. Then they start to produce keratin in the stratum spinosum. They die by the time you get into the stratum granulosum, where that keratin now gels around, sort of like our Gore-Tex layer. That's going to be our waterproofing and, that, and helping us prevent us from dehydrating out. Then you have stratum lucidum, which is more for protection. So it gets really, really thick in areas of high abrasion. That's where our calluses will be. And then stratum corneum, just the outermost layer, the real flaky layer. Okay, so you should know that. You should know the, strat the melanocytes are located down in the stratum basal or stratum ger um, germativum because it's actually infusing pigment into those cells that are then growing out. Dermis. We have two layers within the dermis. What are those layers called? Papillary. And tell me about the papillary layer. It's real hilly, real bumpy. 
It's what? It has sensory neurons. Yep, so it's the arrangement, even though it's hilly all over else, when it comes to the ends of your fingers, its arrangement actually forms your fingerprints. So the papillary layer, also the hilly nature of it, allows it to link in with your epidermis to keep it epidermis locked onto your skin so you're not just wiping it off and sloughing it off. Now, what's the main um, connective tissue layer that's the strong layer of the dermis? Dense irregular, and it's in the reticular layer of the dermis. No relation to the reticular fibers of the spleen. So that's not there, but it's oddly named that way. So the reticular layer of the dermis has dense irregular connective tissue. It's where the glands are going to be hanging out. It's where hair, the follicles, sensory receptors. Who can tell me some sensory receptors that are in the dermis? So thermo, it's going to be temperature. And what about the sensory touch ones? The Merkels. So what do they do? Yep, Merkel is fine touch as well as Meissner's. Um, Meissner's corpuscles and Merkel cells are both fine touch. They're going to be really close to the surface. That's why they are fine touch. Um, and then what are the ones that are going to be really deep down? Pacinian and Ruffini. Yep. So what does Pacinian detect or sense? Deep pressure. Deep pressure. And it actually accommodates quite quickly. Um, and what about Ruffini? Twisting distortion. Yes, so it moved me kind of a twisting side to side. There you go. Excellent. Good job. People were studying this weekend. Okay, accessory structures. The types, we already talked about them. Glands, hair follicles, those are some of the accessory structures that we have in the skin. Um, hair and nail, fingernails too. Hair and fingernails are made of keratin. The same that's going to be in our epidermis, just a little bit of a different version of it, you know. So um, it can be a little bit more thicker, obviously, in the hair, and even tougher and thicker in the nails, just in a thicker layer there. Um, the features of the hair follicles, we really don't want to go into too much detail, just because there's enough other stuff to know that um, just know it's the follicle. The end of the follicle does have a little nerve ending, which is why if you pluck a hair, it hurts. So each one has its own nerve ending, which helps us also to feel where we are in place. So think of, maybe we're not so hairy on our surface, but think of a cat um, and just touching its fur without touching its skin, it would know that you're touching it because it, the fur would move and it actually is sensing this hair or the neuron there. So um, not like the hair down here, you wouldn't notice it, but if you're moving it where the follicle is. Um, um, also on hair follicles, what gives us goosebumps? Yep, erector pili muscles. So they're going to contract. That hair, which is normally laid at an angle, is going to sit more upright. It actually gives us loft and creates a trapping of air, theoretically, um, and that's supposed to warm, um, make you warmer. Let's see. And a recap on the gland secretion location. So we talk about the glands in epithelial tissue because it's made of epithelial tissue. But I recapped it here. It's the same exact glands, the merocrine, the apocrine, and the holocrine. They're just found in the dermis, and they're um, a part here, although they're made of epithelial tissue. So I just it's sort of redundant, but I wanted to make sure it was in context of where you would find them. Okay. And the last part of this chapter is we want to go through the injury repair process. So the injury repair, first we have bleeding. Bleeding is going to flush out any of the bacteria or anything that's in there. So it kind of helps, bleeding helps clean out the wound. Then we have a cleanup process. We have macrophages, which is a type of cells that come in, and they're just cleaning up the debris. It's like if a tornado went through you know, a city, you can't rebuild until you clean up the damaged buildings. So that's what we've got going with our cells. Our cells, we have inflammation that's going to bring immune system fighters, because in case the bacteria did make it in and didn't get flushed out with the blood, we want to make sure we nix them before they get 
further in our body. So we have our immune system that's going to show up. This is where the inflammation part comes in. But we also have the cleaner uppers. So that's what's going on too. And then we start with these granulation cells. That's sort of like these where we're making new cells, we're making new fibers, and then the fibers, collagen fibers, are going to zigzag back and forth to help bring the cut, the sides together and anchor them. But the organized pattern of the collagen zigzagging back and forth makes it more visually distinct, which is what a scar ultimately is. But meanwhile, the scab, the dried blood from step one, is drying and it's receding upward. So it's still sort of holding, although lightly binding the wound together while we're zigzagging the collagen and sewing it up from inside out. And so that scab will finally slough off at the very end when we finally reapproximated the sides and, and put it back together. What about burns? We have the degrees, which tells us how deep the burn penetrated through our skin. So it gives us a sense of depth in terms of damage. What is a first degree burn? Just the epidermis is damaged, yeah. Yes. And then if you have a really severe sunburn where you have blistering, that's now second degree. Excellent. So now you've damaged down into the dermis, and that's where you're actually going to have some a more long-term effects because you're actually causing direct damage to the collagen, and that's where, you know, you're supposed to be wearing your sunblock, and then you won't have some people I know. Um, we have one of the faculty members. She's like sunblock all the time, barely goes out in the day. She's like, was 10 years older than me and she's got like zero wrinkles and you know she's never out in the sun and so the sun is what the cut and that's and also that's what the uv lights are going and damaging our collagen and you can accelerate that with more burns down into the second degree layer what about third degree burns there did you damage the nerve cells and so are they painful within the burn itself no, just the, area the edges are very painful because those nerve cells are still intact and the neurons are just firing like crazy. But within the burn itself, it's not painful because there's no sensory response from there. Um, okay, excellent. What, is the, what does the rule of nines tell us? The percent of surface area. Yeah, so not the depth. It's like how much of our body got covered. So it's not really about a severity in terms of how deep did the burn go, but how much coverage, because it's really, really important for us to know with regard to hydration. So we can get dehydrated very, very easily because if you have a great deal of surface that's going to be exposed. So the um, rule of nines is a way to estimate that. So you can just sort of imagine you know, like one arm is 9%, but a leg is pretty much twice as much of an arm. So it's like twice as big, so it's 18. So you can think of a whole front of the leg as being 9% and the whole back of a leg also being 9%. So it's a good way to estimate, you know, those. And so your test will, I'll have a question of saying like, here's a person and I'll describe like, it's got like the front of a leg and an arm burnt. Like, you know, I'll try to be, you know, a little, body regions and then tell me how much is, you know, how much surface is. So you want to use your rule of nines to estimate the coverage um, that would have been damaged by that description. So for bone physiology, so the tissues in the bone are probably the two hardest parts for this unit to kind of focus on that have the most kind of components to remember. And we're going to deal with just the overview of bone and what bone's really made of. So bone, the overview just being, what does it do? It gives us structure. It actually stores things like our minerals, it stores fat because there's fat going to be in the long bone. It also does hematopoiesis. What does that mean? It's in our red marrow and it makes our blood cells. Excellent. Your overview and composition. Tell me about the organic and inorganic parts of bone. So the collagen's the rebar, yes, but it's the collagen gives it the shape that the bone is going to take, and then the inorganic is the cement, and that's going to fill in, and so it kind of fills in around the collagen, and so between the two, 
We want our bones to have some give. We don't want to be bendy, you know, we're not Gumby. That's really saying, hey, of the two, if a bone is has too much inorganic and not enough organic components, what kind of bone is it going to be? What is it going to be? Real brittle. Yeah, hard but very brittle. Um, but then you go the opposite end of the spectrum. We have a lot more organic and not enough inorganic. What's going to happen? Be real bendy. Mm -hmm. That would be like rickets disease, where you have kids with that, or the other one would be more of a loss of brittle bone disease. Uh, the other way. We already talked about the bone cells. You have osteocytes, but then we have bone building cells, the osteoblasts, and the bone breaking down cells, osteoclasts. Now, osteoclasts don't have to be considered to be bad. They are part of normal bone health. We're constantly building up and we're constantly tearing down. So it helps us to make new. What becomes bad is when you have more breakdown than you do build up. So you, there's always got to be a balance between the two. That's right. So if, for instance, you're going to be bedridden and under bed rest, you're going to have a lot more osteoclast activity because it's going to bring your bone down to match only the stress that you put on the bone. So if you're going to be standing up and dealing with gravity a lot, just gravity keeps uh, us with some bone mass. So if you go out to space and you don't have gravity pushing down on you, you'll actually lose bone mass. If you're going to lift weights or do higher impact um, exercise where you actually have pressure waves sort of reverberating through your bones, you're going to increase bone mass. Your body's going to um, increase resiliency in response to these stresses that it feels coming onto it. What is the membrane around the outside of bone, the living membrane? It's called periosteum. Exact peri meaning around. What's the one lining the inside of the long bone? Endosteum, exactly. And the periosteum and endosteum are really, really important when you have a bone break because they're going to be these membranes that's going to stabilize that and be sort of the framework for the bone cells to go in. So we'll get to that at the end of this. So you should know periosteum and endosteum. So now the structure and ossification. Compact bone, where is that found? Is all of the bone compact bone? No. And it's on the outside of flat bones. It's the outside of all of our bones. It's sort of like the outer crust. It's just compact bones on the outside, particularly on long bones where you have the shaft, which is obviously the diaphysis. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but it's made of compact bone, which is lots of these little circular arrangements. Each one, if you want to think of it like a tree that's been cut because it looks like tree rings. Each one of those is known as an osteon or haversian system. Compact bone is made of many of those. Each one of those osteons has to some blood vessels, an artery and vein going through it. And so even though our compact bone seems really, really dense, there's actually little blood vessels going through each and every one of them, and it keeps it really healthy. So you should know the components of the haversian system. You should be able to know the central canal and what's in it, blood vessels. You should know the rings that form this a single osteon. Those are known as lamellae. Out within the rings, usually between them, are little caves, like little scooped out areas known as lacunae. Inside the lacunae is where a bone cell or osteocyte would live. They used to be osteoblasts that built the lamellae, built the bone, and then they're sort of just dormant, sitting in there in these lacunae. And then coming out from the lacunae are canaliculi, and those are little cracks in there for nutrients and things. So those are all things that you should be able to identify, and there will be a picture, a bone histology picture on your lab practical, and I will be pointing to pretty much all of those and asking you to name them. So hematopoiesis, we've already established that it's bone cell making. Where does that take place? The spongy bone, also known as red marrow. Yes, so they're both. When I ask you that question, either one of those answers would be correct. Red marrow or spongy bone. Um, so spongy bone is different than compact bone. How? Mm. 
Well, compact bone is around the outside, but the spongy bone is made, has spaces in between. Compact bone is all these osteons all stacked up next to each other, so it's really dense and really strong. But then spongy bone is a balance of trying to not have our bones be so dense and heavy. So it's these little beans, or what? So the spongy bone also are trabeculated, meaning it's kind of branched and web-like, and they're going to be found in flat bone as well as at the ends, the bulbous ends of long bone. So if we do long bone anatomy, what are those bulbous ends called? Epiphysis. Epi yes, epiphysis is the bulbous long bone ends where spongy bone is found or red bone marrow is found. Also flat bones is all spongy bone inside. That's where spongy bone or red marrow is also found. What about in long bones, the shaft? What is that called? Diaphysis. Excellent. And there's yellow marrow in there because if you pulled out the yellow marrow, which is fat, it would just be a tube, like PVC pipe. But in it is actually contains fat. And what, how do long bones grow? What is the term for that? Ossification. So ossification is bone growth. So we've got two kinds of ossification. One is going to be for long bones, and the other is for flat bones. Endochondral. What does endochondral mean? Inside cartilage. Inside cartilage. Fantastic. So endochondral ossification is how long bones grow, which means they use what? Epiphyseal plates that are there at the junction between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. It's actually known as the metaphysis, but I don't include metaphysis because I don't want to add another term in there. So we have the epiphyseal plates, which are made of what type of tissue? Hyaline cartilage. Fantastic. So we have a hyaline, so we have a long bone. We have an epiphyseal plate here, and we have one down below. So if it's in our femur, we have one up high and one down below. And so what happens for the down below one, cartilage is growing further down towards the floor, but bone cells are invading behind. The one higher up, cartilage cells are growing upward, and bone cells are invading. So they're going away from the middle of the diaphysis. So they're radiating out from both ends. So we grow long bones that way in two directions. And so the more the cartilage moves forward and the more the bone cells move in, the longer the bone is going to get. Once you hit puberty, the sex hormones start to get released in the body. Those epiphyseal plates start their demise and start to seal up. So no longer bone growth it doesn't be, it becomes a priority anymore. It becomes more reproductive issues for the body. Um, so what about flat bone growth? intramembranous ossification and what does that mean between membranes so think of almost like you know if you're going to laminate something you got like two you know plastic pieces right two plastic sheets that's like between two membranes so imagine a little couple of seed bone cells right in the middle and then you have this sort of membrane covering the space that you want flat bone. And then the seeds are going to grow out and grow to fill in this space, in this laminated space. So it's between the membranes. That's how flat bone and some of the irregular bones um, and short bones are going to be made. And they're all only filled with the red marrow. So we don't have any cartilage involved there. It's just bone cells filling out the space as defined by these membranes. So we need to talk about factors that affect remodeling. What are some things that we experience just in general that's going to cause increased bone mass? Bone mass. Exercise. So, and the type is important. Jumping and pounding where you have a lot of force going through your bones. Running, high impact is going to increase your bone mass more than swimming. So, it doesn't mean swimming's bad. It's a great exercise. But if you're looking to thicken up your bones, that's maybe not as great of an option. Um, but it's still part of a good, healthy, you know, workout routine. So, you may want to do some other more impact. So, if people are compromising some of their um, joint mobility and they, have, they opt to use swimming as an exercise, they have to then consider other ways of getting in maintained bone mass. Um, so you want impact, that's going to increase bone mass. And we already talked about space, space flight, the lack of gravity, 
that's going to actually decrease bone mass and bed rest, those kind of things. So clinically, you guys are going to experience, see patients with more bed rest issues or um, if they've had damage, you have um, massive bone loss. If you say someone has a knee break or something like that and it's immobilized, they'll have bone loss in that too. How do we balance calcium? So more specifically, what are the two hormones involved in either raising blood calcium or lowering blood calcium? Yep, so we got calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. So what does calcitonin do? It lowers it from the blood, exactly. It decreases blood calcium. So first, calcitonin says bones. Do you need any? Do we need to top you off bones? Gives bones first shot at the calcium. The bone's like, I'm fine. And then it says gut. We don't need any more. So it blocks absorption. Then it says kidneys. Could you pee some out? We have some extra calcium around. So that's what calcitonin does. It's just going to lower it from the blood. But what does parathyroid hormone do? It's going to raise blood calcium. And how does it do that? Yep. So it's going to say, hey, osteoclast, we need you to start dissolving some of the bone so you can release some of the calcium out of the bone in order to circulate. So Because we need to use calcium to get business done in the body. Let's used for cofactors, to in your liver for a lot of things, it's used for muscle contractions, used for blood clotting, a lot of things that way. Hormones that affect bone growth. So I have a list for you, it's in your um, sheet there, but you've got like thyroxin's gonna increase bone growth, but I wanted to make you relate it back to the bone cells, the osteoclast versus the osteoblast. So you wanna think of building up bone, things will be like progesterone, testosterone, um, even thyroid hormone, you're gonna, even calcitonin's not really a great bone builder, but since we sort of talked about the calcium, I sort of let that one go in that category. So you wanna think, think of things that are actually gonna increase bone size. That's gonna be an osteoblast. Then you have an osteoclast. What are things that's gonna activate osteoclast that's gonna break down bone? Cortisol, stress. So that's gonna be one of the bigger ones. Um, do we have anything else? No, that one's going to come up in a second. They do target osteoclasts, but they're not going to increase their rate. Where's parathyroid? Yes, parathyroid. That would be the other one. So you have parathyroid hormone that's actually going to increase osteoclasts to break down more bone. And then she brought up estrogen. Estrogen does stimulate, or sorry, estrogen affects osteoclasts, but instead of activating them like stress would, that would decrease mass, Estrogen deactivates the osteoclast, so it slows or stops the breakdown of bone. But estrogen does not build bone, contrary to common belief. So estrogen is gonna slow the breakdown, which women often will do hormone replacement therapy in because of concerns for osteoporosis. But if they truly are doing it correct, they wanna take estrogen to prevent the loss, but then they need to take progesterone natural progesterone specifically to promote the growth and building of bone. So those are the bounds. So I wanted to make that distinction. Um, tell me about growth hormone. Obviously it makes us grow. So it does that. So what if growth hormone, while the epiphyseal plates are present, what if our growth hormone, we have a lot of it, like our pituitary gland sends a huge amount out. We have giantism, exactly. So we, and then so we have a lot of the endochondral ossification, a lot of cartilages laying out, the bones growing in, and it's just fast forwarding the growth of these long bones. That's gonna be giantism, excessive amount of growth hormone while the epiphyseal plates are open. What if you have excessive amount of growth hormone, usually because of a tumor, after the plates are closed? Yeah, acromegaly, exactly. So now you still have growth, but it's, you can't do it on long bones anymore because they've stopped growing because the endocon uh, epiphyseal plates are gone. So acromegaly, you're going to have more hands and face. You're going to have more of these soft tissues, and you're going to have a significant amount of growth there. What happens if while the epiphyseal plates are open, there just isn't the stimulus telling it to even grow? So you have lack of growth hormone during that time. What do you have? Pituitary dwarfism, exactly. Okay. Um, and the role of vitamin D, all that does, well, vitamin D has lots of additional roles, particularly in our immune system, bone health that's outside of just the calcium. But here I just have it limited to the old 
what we knew vitamin D. So vitamin D traditionally is just help us absorb calcium. But now we know over the last 10 years, a huge amount of research done on vitamin E, sorry, D, that plays a huge role in the immune system, um, even to autoimmune diseases, as well as um, memory and diabetes and all kinds of health, heart health, things like that. So vitamin D has a wide range. Um, you don't want too much. So vitamin D, as well as vitamin A, mostly vitamin A, you don't want too much. Those are the two vitamins you can have too much of. Um, vitamin D, you want to be take enough that you have, I think it's like 60 milligrams per deciliter. I don't I believe kind of that you're within that range, but you don't have to know that for the test. Just know that for, the limp, for our bone physiology component, do you know that it just helps us to absorb our calcium? And that's all you need to know as far as we go here. And finally, the fracture and repair. So the steps are really not that unlike the skin. You're gonna have a break. It's gonna break away. So we have bleeding. We create this blood hematoma. So we got this picture here. So you have this blood hematoma here. And then all of a sudden you get an external, an internal callus. So this is where you have the periosteum and the endosteum that's going to help brace it and bracket it. Now there's still membranes, they're pretty wonky. So that's why you wanna have it casted to do it. But if you're, you know, this is what's going on inside. We're forming these calluses. And then once this framework is put into place, then we have the bone cells can actually start to invade and start to fill in the gaps. And then we have remodeling over up to several years, but you're gonna have it quite a bit thicker at the area of the break to overcompensate, to make it stronger, to try to overcompensate for the damage that's been done. And over the years, this becomes smaller and smaller. And so this bony callus um, will actually reduce in size to where you won't have it as noticeable, but they're quite a bit thicker for quite a number of years just to um, increase the strength of that break area. And that's it for our first test.